Thank you. Welcome to the Sears Anti-Aging Institute. So is everyone here? If you're not here, raise your hand. <laughs> so uh, what am I supposed to talk about? Oh, yeah. Uh, 14 Secrets. So this is a very uh, practical presentation. It's intended for you to be able to leave here with things that you can use, OK? We have. Um, various levels of interventionist approaches in the treatment of potency issues. Some of them are best done by you. Uh, you determine your own uh, dosage, your own schedule, and you determine what works best for you. So we'll, we'll go through some of those things. They are outlined, I think, pretty well in the book that you received. Everyone received the 12 secrets? No. 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 Oh. It's in their gift packet. Oh, it's in your gift packet. You're going to get the 12 secrets to virility. The, um, the second book that I wrote on this issue back about 10 years ago. Yeah, show it to them. That, that book. I think I may have a picture. Oh, there it is. <laughs> Don't you just love my team? <laughs> I want a picture. And there it is. So that book will tell you a lot of what you need uh, for the, the basic nutritional exercise, avoidance of negative things, uh, some of the big issues that we all face living in the, in the modern world. It's part of how this uh, research originated. Um, I, I think I should maybe tell you a little bit about that. Uh, I was a, uh, a strength coach in college and my connection was to sports medicine. Then that was a very exciting time in the mid 70s and late 70s uh, for that kind of endeavor. Um, things were legal then that aren't legal now. Um, growth hormone was uh, not genetically engineered like it is now, but available from pituitary glands. And it was used as a performance enhancer. We had various forms of testosterone that were used originally by the bodybuilding community that had made its way into athletics. And we had um, kind of wild, wild west with the Soviet Union uh, making this extract from Tribulus terrestris that we'll talk about that's very effective at boosting testosterone. And we had, remember, those testosterone precursors that became available. Uh, the androstein dione that Mark McGuire used to uh, break the home run uh, record that has since been uh, made illegal. It was really during that time that I kind of uh, transitioned from uh, sports medicine to general health and particularly a focus on performance enhancement. Kind of for the weekend athlete initially, and then for the older guy uh, later. And that's how my first book, uh, The T-Factor, came about, which is all about testosterone. And then this uh, second book on that subject, about looking at some of the problems with uh, testosterone therapy. Which, by the way, 10 years later, they're worse now than they were then. Those, those T-clinics that you hear about, they're doing a worse job um, at administering testosterone than we were in the early days, about 1980. Um, it's become um, concerning. It's so commercial. Uh, you don't just give testosterone to everyone. There's problems with that. So secret number one, still the king of hormones, testosterone, very powerful. Um, I thought that when we would um, see the progression of pharmaceuticals and the involvement of uh, nutraceuticals that we would get better at dosing testosterone. Unfortunately, that hasn't quite happened, and I'll talk about some of the problems. But testosterone, it's important for both men and women. It provides those things that make life better. Um, it improves mood, improves strength, <coughs> improves um, uh, cognition, and even intelligence is associated with uh, testosterone. And men's brains are about one-third bigger than women's brains. 
uh, partly because of the anabolic, uh, the, the trophic effect of testosterone on the brain. And for women, that role is mostly played by progesterone, but testosterone also plays an important role in mood and uh, libido in women as well. Uh, and it's not addressed by the pharmaceutical solutions like Viagra and Levitra and, and Cialis. Uh, also, in contrast to um, what the pharmaceutical industry tried to sell us, that testosterone was somehow dangerous. I mean, as amazing as it sounds, I went to um, um, clinics to teach doctors on how to treat erectile dysfunction and saw a series of doctors stand up in front of the podium and say testosterone has no effect on sexual function. Testosterone is totally ineffective for treating erectile dysfunction. That was right at the time that um, uh, Levitra had just hit the market copying um, uh, Viagra, which became the most successful drug of all time. And you know, it cost $10 a pill then when it came out and everyone complained about the cost, you know what it costs now? Yes, yeah. If you could get a discount, you might be able to buy it in the 30s. Um, but that's 22 years after patent. How can that happen? It should be generic a long time ago. Who makes these decisions? I read that, that Viagra has made over $100 billion in profit after paying for all their research and all the other costs uh, associated with production. So you would think the price would come down, and it, of course it should if the free market were at work there. In Africa, generic Viagra costs $1.50. Yeah, and you can buy it online um, for as cheap as $6 for, uh, it's probably made in China. Um, but it, it's just, um, it's a disappointment to me because I thought at that time that uh, finally my faith in pharmaceuticals is restored. This Viagra, when put together with things um, that can replenish the body's capacity to produce that nitrous oxide. Remember, Viagra blocks the breakdown of the vasodilator in a, and that's how it works. We have natural ways to boost NO production. So I thought the next sequence would obviously be uh, natural ways to boost it combined with uh, blockades of phosphodiesterase isoenzyme 5, which uh, prevents the breakdown. So at that time, there was a, a campaign to discredit testosterone's role in erectile dysfunction, and it was very successful. Convention bought it. You can find a lot of published uh, studies that seem to, produce, uh, to actually prove this ridiculous, uh, preposterous uh, claim, similar to the ridiculousness over statin drugs and, and heart disease. It um, is worse now than 25 years ago when I started to say how no one should take a statin drug. At that point, there were very few people on it. Now there's, there's tens of millions of people on it. Uh, so here's the issue, right? Testosterone is good. It is the most effective treatment for erectile dysfunction, bar none by far. But there are issues in that uh, nature decides to withdraw its production. Um, these are um, some of the problems with giving testosterone. Um, testosterone therapy can be effective, but your body is not a machine. You can't just uh, beat it straight with a hammer. It's a, it's a reactive system. It uh, interprets its environment and it adjusts. What happens if you give testosterone from the outside? Who knows? If I give you testosterone, what's gonna happen to your own testosterone? Exactly, yeah. The, the first reaction is you're gonna shut down endogenous internal production of testosterone because your body will notice it's got more testosterone than it planned on having. Mm -hmm. Does anybody know the second thing, which is really more problematic? Yeah. 
your, your body will decrease production to get it back to its set point. When it finds, because you keep dosing testosterone, your testosterone is still high, then it upregulates the degradation of testosterone. Your body can only get rid of testosterone in one of two ways, and they're both negative, and we'll talk about those. So you want to be as natural as possible. We mentioned this tribulus terrestris. It's been around a long time now, uh, and we have pretty good uh, evidence of how it works. It mimics the hormone, luteinizing <coughs> hormone, and um, stimulates the Sertoli cells in the testes to produce more testosterone. So in that way, it's, um, it's working with your body system, very uh, natural. Um, we also have um, natalensis, uh, which is popular among um, native uh, African tribes that preserve their, their culture of, of dependence on herbal remedies. Um, and they have it going on in that regard. They, they, I mean, they they, it's very developed in some of the African cultures. It's, it's funny to go there and travel. I mean, where I go to Uganda, they have one word for work. And, and you can't, you know, differentiate <laughs> about hard work and, and labor and manual labor. Uh, it's just one thing. <laughs> but they have, I think, about 40 words for parts of the uh, sexual anatomy for both men and women. Uh, it, it makes you think because you go, oh yeah, that does exist, but I never really thought of <laughs> differentiating it. I mean, I won't go into detail, but uh, they do. So, so it's uh, very important to some of the traditional cultures. Um, and we get a lot of information by looking back in time uh, to some of those native cultures. Uh, Central America, South America, um, the um, Far East, um, with some of the precursors to traditional Chinese medicine and uh, the diversity of the African cultures is where a lot of my uh, research comes from. So we talked about the problem with testosterone therapy is that you will process it and try to get rid of it. You only have two ways of getting rid of it. One of them is to convert it to estrogen, which is bad news for a man who's trying to improve sexual function because estrogen blocks the effect of testosterone. The more you convert your testosterone to estrogen, the less effective your testosterone is. And then you can have good blood levels, look okay on the laboratory, but still have the same problem or even worse than the problem. And what I inherit from a lot of those low T clinics is I have a worse problem now than if they would have came to me from the beginning because now they have increased the production of the enzyme, which is called aromatase, which converts testosterone to estrogen. Then once you convert it to estrogen, you excrete it in the urine. But that process of having that estrogen in the blood has feminizing effects that men don't like. Um, one of the worst ones is that it produces subcutaneous body fat. You notice how women have smoother surface of their skin. They have um, less definition of their muscle, less uh, vascularity. That's mostly the effect of estrogen, which layers in um, a, a cosmetic layer of fat underneath the skin. For women, it makes them smooth, more feminine. For men, it gives you kind of a pasty doughboy look that is very uh, non-masculine. And I often encounter that when I see people who have therapy from the outside. This can be addressed. We can measure your estrogen, and, and as much as I say this, and I say it a lot to anyone that will listen, it's still not being done in most of those clinics. Uh, but you have to measure uh, total estrogen, and, and if it's a problem, you may want to differentiate among the three different kinds of estrogen. And these are some of the things you can do. If it's really bad, we can detox with uh, chelation. Uh, also, just those general um, detoxifying, purifying therapies like uh, sauna, uh, infrared, uh, strenuous exercise, 
uh, that flushes the body, can help to get rid of it. These supplements are pretty effective. Been using them a long time. Uh, probably the most effective is in uh, um, DIM, diendomethane, which is related to the second one, indol-3-carbamol. Indol-3-carbamol exists in nature in that form. And uh, we used to, I used that first when I was about in 10th grade, when I was uh, uh, experimenting for some state fair things, trying to uh, grow uh, mutants of plants for the state fair. We used indol 3 carbamol It's a, um, a, a growth hormone for plants. But in human beings, it helps to um, eliminate estrogen. It doesn't block its production. What it does is it binds to estrogen and makes it more soluble in the urine so that you get rid of it. Um, uh, zinc and selenium are important in maintaining the ratio of testosterone to estrogen, which is really the way your body interprets that estrogen level. Secret number three, eat like a man. Uh, this is kind of a, a paleo approach. When I first put this in the book, it was before paleo. I got a lot of flack for this, by the way. Nobody wants to eat like a caveman. What are you, crazy? Uh, are you telling people to eat fat? It wasn't uh, popular. Um, but now, uh, it is, right? Uh -huh. It's the biggest section of uh, diet books. If you go to a bookstore like Barnes & Noble, you'll find a whole shelf on paleo this and that. Um, but it was really deduced uh, from the clear-cut difference between sexual performance and the incidence of erectile dysfunction among farmer cultures as compared to among hunter-gatherers. The hunter-gatherers don't generally have this problem. Why? Because they're eating the way nature intended you to eat with uh, the right kinds of fat, the right kinds of <coughs> omega-3, particularly DHA. Um, and the right uh, minerals, which is also one of the secrets. Uh, we don't get the minerals that we need to produce testosterone anymore. And then uh, number four, um, uh, durational cardiovascular endurance drives testosterone down. Exercise can be effective at increasing testosterone, but it's got to be uh, the contrarian opposite to what you've been told to do. Short bursts of high intensity and progressively increasing the intensity as you become conditioned for it is uh, more in line with the native challenges that we would have gotten for all of human history until we started farming, and then you got durational challenges. The farmer stays in his field all day, the hunter-gatherer, and, and you know, I really didn't know this before I went and lived with them, but they, they hunt maybe once every two or three days. And it's, it's generally, you know, a long walk um, punctuated with some very strenuous activity. They might climb a tree to try to drive a monkey out, or they, they might uh, run ahead of a wild boar and try to trap it, and, and then there's some, uh, extreme exertion during the killing phase, but it's always very brief. And then, you know, they, they carry it home, they give it to the women, and they, they lie around in hammocks, and they, they brag about the kill for, for two or three days, and, and they sleep during the day. It's, they, don't, they don't have the drive like we do, the way where you feel like you feel compelled to stay active. So that's not the issue with American deconditioning. Americans are not lazy. They're not even overly um, um, sedative. Um, we exert ourselves at a low level of exertion for too long, with too much distracting us, too much to try to get done. And then we avoid the things that really condition us, which are high intensity bursts. And that's what we are built for. In a native environment, when you are caught in that hunter gatherer and um, prey and, and catching your food or being uh, the food of another animal, you, you have to exert yourself at maximum capacity and you have to accelerate very quickly or you don't survive. And of course, that's a very strong evolutionary uh, drive. 
So the anti-cardio exercise, progressively accelerating cardiopulmonary exertion. I have four books on it. We have lots of stuff on it. If you're interested, uh, I'll give you a free book. Um, declining lung volume is one of the issues of modern uh, deconditioning. And to increase your lung volume, you need to challenge your lung volume. Aerobics doesn't do that. Aerobics works within your, your current uh, VO2 max. So we have tests for this. It's one of the most important things we measure in our biological age assessment. Uh, your lungs shrink with age, and it's a bad thing, but it is reversible. And it has a direct effect on testosterone production and on um, longevity and uh, potency for men. Muscle mass, uh, similar. Uh, you guys mostly know about that. The uh, prostate is actually very involved in, um, in libido and in sexual performance. It's not only a negative when it becomes enlarged because of uh, DHT, the benign prostatic hypertrophy, is mostly a consequence of the other conversion of testosterone, which we're seeing a lot of in the T clinics again. Um, you either convert it to estrogen or you convert it to DHT. If you convert it to DHT, it's nine times more powerful than testosterone at stimulating overgrowth of your prostate. But it is something you can address. Not caused by testosterone, there you go, nine times more. It's converted, from the conversion of testosterone to DHT is this enzyme 5-alpha reductase, which is what the, the prescription medi medication Proscar, if any of you have been treated, the, the first line of defense is usually uh, Proscar, finasteride. It blocks the conversion of testosterone to uh, DHT by binding to the enzyme 5-alpha reductase. We have a, a, another one, which has now become more popular because Proscar is off, um, off patent and is now inexpensive. So all of the doctors get marketing for the new one, Avidart. So uh, Avidart blocks both uh, isoenzymes of 5-alpha reductase. And also there's another one, um, um, uh, Propecia, which is used for male uh, uh, balding because DHT not only causes enlargement of the prostate, it also causes uh, male pattern balding. It uh, binds to the hair receptor and creates senescence and eventual death of that uh, follicle. Oh, and there are some ways of treating this. Most of the treatments evolve around this beta cytosterol, which is still the most effective thing for blocking 5-alpha uh, reductase. Um, the uh, Europeans um, have um, used uh, pumpkin seed extract uh, for some time now, um, where um, uh, saw palmetto is the American solution. 80% of the world's saw palmetto is made in what state? Florida. Florida, Florida yeah. Yeah, I have it grown at my house. It's easy to grow and it works very well. It has uh, some of the highest concentrations of beta cytosterol. The other source is um, um, a Pygeum africanus, a Pygeum bark from Africa. The natives pretty much used up the source in selling it. It's popular in traditional Chinese medicine. The Chinese bought it all up. But now they have a lot of plantations where they grow in the Pygeum back. I visited some. As a matter of fact, my foundation is involved with planting some uh, Pygeum uh, Africanus trees. Um, HGH. Um, again, um, a very, um, it's a double-edged sword, you got to be careful with it. Uh, all hormones um, can be powerful, um, but they can also have negative consequences when used inappropriately. We probably used more growth hormone um, 20 years ago than I use now. We still use it, but uh, we're just a little more careful and more selective about who gets growth hormone, how long do you do it, because it has that same uh, compensatory reaction problem. 
that testosterone has. If I give you growth hormone, what's going to happen? You're going to decrease the pituitary's production of growth hormone. Uh, so you have to be cognizant of that problem and you have to manage that too. You have to manage not only the deficiency, but you have to manage the body's compensatory reaction to the correction of that deficiency. And, and on and on, it's uh, a complicated system. Um, and it's where the, the biggest problems with chronic drug therapy comes. You know, uh, uh, drugs again, your body notices that, uh, that alien molecule and it tries to eliminate it and it gets pretty good at it. And it tries to negate the effect of that over time. So pharmaceuticals can be very effective when you sneak them up on the body's physiology, but you give the physiology, uh, the physiological adaptive mechanisms long enough and they will win. And that's why we, we think of drugs as a stopgap, a temporary solution. Sometimes they're necessary, but it's not the end of the road. When we use that drug, we're still struggling with finding out what caused the problem, eliminate that, and find other ways to treat the symptoms so that we can remove the toxic effect of the drug. Every drug is a foreign toxic burden, and it is not um, the end of treatment. It is maybe a necessary step towards the beginning of treatment. You can boost uh, HGH naturally with um, arginine. Arginine is still the gold standard. Um, it um, is very effective uh, when given at high enough doses. Five grams tends to be the optimal dose, uh, but you need at least a couple of grams, which means none of those pills that say they boost growth hormone can really be effective. You need a, a powder because you can't get two grams in a pill, right? Uh, two grams of glutamine, astragalus. Astragalus was used in uh, traditional Chinese and Ayurvedic medicine as an anti-aging, um, uh, kind of a daily uh, tonic. Um, and it turns out that lo and behold, it boosts, boosts growth hormone and it turns on the enzyme telomerase. If this were a different lecture, we'd be talking about the power of astragalus and turning on telomerase. Coenzyme Q10, very good for the heart, originally isolated from cow's heart, has a big role in sexual performance, but you need to take the reduced form, especially if you're beyond about 55 years old, uh, because we just don't absorb uh, the ubiquinone you need uh, ubiquinol, and it's uh, eight times more powerful, and uh, the doses that actually work are somewhere in the neighborhood of 800 to 2,000 uh, milligrams of ubiquinone, which translates to about 100 milligrams of ubiquinol. Um, inflammation, inflammation is problematic in that it affects the blood flow. Uh, and when inflammation is high intravascularly, it causes a vasoreactive response, which uh, will dilate blood flow in certain parts and constrict blood flow in other areas. So you have to kind of um, get beyond that impediment to blood flow in order for some of the other things to work. Uh, turmeric. Um, is one of the best things we found, curcumin uh, made from the spiced uh, turmeric. Uh, very effective, that's how it works. It takes uh, about a gram. We also find it works better when you combine it with uh, galangal, which I found in uh, Bali when I traveled there. It's part of the traditional uh, Balinese uh, uh, triple um, uh, combination that they use for inflammation. They also use uh, ginger and holy basil. And these guys, the galangal, ginger, and holy basil can be in smaller doses if you give it with a large dose of turmeric. What else do you need to make turmeric work? Pepper. What's in on? Pepper. Yes, pepper. yes. Uh, blood, yeah, pepper. Uh, black pepper. Uh, you need that to make it absorbable in the gut. Um, your uh, your brain is the biggest sexual organ, right? I think that's true. Uh, you boost brain power with the neurotransmitter acetylcholine, but there's another reason why this works as an adjunct for um, 
sexual performance. And that is that you also need acetylcholine for uh, muscles to work. Um, it's a big uh, general um, performance enhancer, not just sexual performance, but performance in a uh, strength test. For instance, the uh, swim test. Anybody know what a swim test is for rats? It's kind of gruesome, but it's a way of eliminating the placebo effect and making sure that you have a motivated participant. You put a rat in um, a bucket of water and you see how long it swims before it drowns. That's called the swim test. But acetylcholine, has been shown to increase the swim test by about 20%. The best that we can do is in the range of 30 to 50% with some of the strong neurostimulatory drugs like methamphetamine and cocaine, for instance. A rat can swim a long time if you give it enough cocaine. Um, and then this get your rocks is a little play on words for uh, minerals. Uh, the minerals are very important. Uh, Linus Pauling, I like his quote here, you can trace every disease and every ailment to a mineral deficiency. Uh, deficiencies are very much ignored by conventional medicine. You can either have a substrate deficiency, that is a deficiency of the things that you need to build, things that you need for your body's optimal function, or you can have some cofactor deficiency, the things that, that uh, upregulate or catalyze those productions. Many of the minerals do that. Selenium, for instance, you can't make testosterone without it, and it's no longer in the soil. It used to be in the dirt. You didn't have to do anything, as long as you weren't too um, um, finicky about what you ate. You got plenty of selenium in the dirt that was on your root vegetables. And, yeah. Just eat some potatoes, the selenium's right there on the skin. Um, but nowadays, it's all been depleted from the soil. It's not in commercial fertilizer. Uh, we are uh, uh, a nation of selenium deficient people. It's also, selenium is also important for uh, glucose metabolism. So it's a part of uh, the cause of the syndrome zero, the exploding incidence of all types of diabetes and obesity because we don't get selenium. You need that for insulin's function. Need it to make testosterone. Chromium is similar. Also, you need it for testosterone, but you need it also for uh, insulin uh, to work. Uh, boron is uh, unique to uh, the cascade of inflammatory uh, enzymes. You need that for for those to be processed to the good things you want and for it not to be processed to the bad things like arachidonic acid that get in the way of blood flow and cause inflammation. And also boron is useful in the whole cascade of sex steroid production, all the way from the precursor. What's the precursor molecule for all sex steroids? <coughs> cholesterol. Yeah, good old cholesterol. The more you have, the more uh, sex steroids you can make. Uh, number 11, we talked about tribulus. 500 milligrams is a pretty good dose. You can take up to two grams. And we still don't know all the details about how the Chinese are using it now, but we know they're, they're cheating with uh, derivatives of tribulus that are so far passing through the uh, test because tribulus is banned. Uh, for Olympic athletes. Um, um, this uh, natalensis we talked about from Africa, another African herb, Bangalala. Uh, it's uh, endemic to the tribes of uh, eastern Africa on the northern shore of Lake uh, Victoria. And uh, really some uh, pretty incredible stuff. We're not we're not quite there getting the highest uh, quality that we would like, and it's very problematic dealing with <coughs> some of those cultures for export. Uh, Garana, Garana is a very uh, developed business. It's a neurostimulant. It's being grown uh, for export. It's being standardized. We can look at the uh, amount of any of the um, metabolites that you might want from uh, Garana when you're sourcing and buying that. It's a common uh, neurostimulant uh, herb. 
interestingly, a lot of the native cultures use the same thing for endurance and neurostimulation alertness <coughs> that they used for sexual stimulus. Uh, Garana is a good example of that. Yohembe is also a good example of that. A strong uh, neurostimulant, not entirely safe for everyone. Um, you have to be careful with it. That's available as an injection, not something we uh, uh, recommend here because of its potential for side effects. But you've got to admit it is very effective. I mean, I went to a, a conference about 20 years ago when they were first developing this as a pharmaceutical for injection. And the guy uh, lectured for a little bit, said, you know, talked about how powerful it is, and then said, I, now I want you to excuse me, I'll be back in five minutes. He went and gave himself an injection and came back with an erection that you could see on stage that he said, see how, this is how powerful and effective it is. <laughs> That's, you know, <laughs> there's no, no question it works. <laughs> But it has to be injected directly into the penis, and unlike some of the other more natural treatments, which can be injected with really uh, no um, negative sensation. You really don't feel them. Yohimbi is uh, different because it is a caustic alkaloid. You, you do feel it. I guess it depends on your motivation. Uh, so secret number 12 is putting it all together. Um, we do uh, sometimes use compounded pharmaceuticals. So these are things that are normally patent drugs, but we can take different doses than what you might get. For instance, we mentioned Proscar and Avidart. Those are now available to compounding pharmacies. So instead of using the five milligram dose that is uh, what Proscar is, the finasteride, we can put a half of a milligram or one milligram, or whatever it takes, because it's a little awkward in down-regulating the dose of Proscar. But the way the pharmaceutical industry works is they're really not too concerned about, about side effects and long-term consequences. They just have to get the thing through the FDA. And that's a big hurdle at the, at the beginning before they can make any money off of their research. So it's all geared towards making sure that you have a distinguishable, a statistically significant difference between your drug and the placebo. So it tends to make very heavy doses because a placebo effect will, will benefit about a third of people. If you give them a, a dummy uh, pill that you tell them it's real, a lot of people will get improvement, incredibly. Yeah. One out of three people. Um, so that's a high hurdle for you have to make sure that your dosage um, includes all people. And people generally have a wide range of dosage that is effective. Um, part of the problem with the negative consequences of, say, the, um, the prescription antidepressant Proscar is it turns out that most people only needed one or two milligrams. But the 20 milligram dose added a few more people, uh, a, a slightly larger percentage. And because we don't really know what we're doing when we're monkeying with those neurotransmitters, um, that little bit of improvement from the very large dose, 10 times what most people needed, was enough to distinguish it. Now you're up to 35% when the placebo was 30%. Um, so we went for about 20 years giving almost everyone 10 times more Proscar than they really needed to get an optimal effect just so that it could be approved and, and cover those last couple of percentages. Because it went from 33%, which was not deemed statistically significant, to 35%. Um, and that's how this industry um, is able to keep that data secret. And, and not tell people that they should just be taking one milligram. So um, it was only exposed years later in lawsuits where, uh, where judges subpoenaed uh, the records and found that they knew and suppressed that research after many, many people died from overdose mm -hmm. and many people had negative consequences. Um, and, and this is no different. The Proscar that they use is way more than most people need, and I can prove it. 
I can dose people in lower doses and find out that they get the same benefit. So before it went off patent and we were able to compound it, what I would do is give somebody ProScar once a week or maybe twice a week and see them back and measure their DHT. But if you measure DHT, you have a very direct metric to measure whether you are sufficiently blocking that enzyme 5 alpha remidase that converts testosterone to DHT. And if you do effectively block it, you do two things. You lower the DHT so that you don't get enlargement of the prostate and the guy doesn't go bald, but also you increase the effect of the testosterone because you're blocking one of the ways that it is uh, processed. But uh, the lower the dose, the, the better, as with all pharmaceuticals. But that was a little bit problematic to get people on those alternate day doses. So now that we can compound it, that's <coughs> the preferred treatment. Um, this is the 13th secret after I wrote that book, The 12 Secrets, which you will all uh, receive in your package. Um, I became uh, very involved in, in research that was looking for a natural way to give the benefit of, of Viagra. Um, because if you put Viagra with testosterone boosting, you get a much more effective pharmaceutical. Again, doses can be uh, uh, smaller, and the pill is so expensive, you can take the 50 milligram and break it in half, and as long as you're putting it together with good uh, NO boosters, it's still quite effective. And then you've reduced the cost from $35 a pill to about $8 a, a dose. Uh, still outrageous, and you can get uh, natural boosters that are pretty effective. Uh, arginine uh, is very effective. Um, I think I have, yeah, there's L-arginine. There's also this one from the bar bodybuilding community again, alpha ketoglutarate, which I've used for years. It is best giving in gram doses, so you have to take a powder. You can put it in a shake. Um, I like mixing it with raw egg. Egg has a lot of the, as a matter of fact, for if you want the most natural uh, performance enhancer, uh, take two raw eggs. Uh, they have so many of these things we've been talking about. It's like a natural uh, Viagra in a shell. Um, this alpha ketoglutarate uh, works when it's at least one gram. There's also this arginine alpha ketoglutarate uh, combination, uh, which um, you can buy at health food stores. We also put it in our, our booster. We have two boosters that we use in combination. One is the a natural combination of herbs to boost testosterone, and the other one we call Primal Max Red, which is a natural formula to improve NO production, because NO causes vasodilation. And, and that one um, has all of these things in it, and, but it, because these are large doses, it has to be as a powder. You put it in water, or you do like I do, and I put it with uh, some uh, uh, protein powder. I put it with coconut oil for fat, and I put a couple eggs in there. And so far, so good. Uh, now, here's the 14th one, which we're introducing uh, new today, which is a, a new um, evolving technology where we take a platelet-rich plasma, what we do is we take your blood and we spin it down and the heavy stuff comes to the bottom which would include all the red blood cells and then there's a layer on the top where the white blood cells and the platelets layer out, we call the buffy coat, and we take that and we separate that from uh, the rest of the blood <coughs> so that we're not injecting red blood cells. In that way, we get about a 10 time increase in the uh, platelets that are in that plasma. Why do that? Because platelets are your body's native repair kit. They are the first responders. We didn't know this until relatively recently, uh, amazingly, but when you are cut, you all know that it's platelets that go to the site. Uh, as you start to leak blood, the platelets accumulate there and they lay down fibrogen, um, they uh, convert uh, proteins in the blood and they attract other cells that then uh, form the clot so that you stop bleeding 
Everyone knows that's platelets, right? But what we didn't know is that the platelets are also the first responders for a cascade of cellular repair mechanisms. <clears throat> when you get a cut, the platelets go, and then the platelets bind there, they stick to that area, and then they burst. And when they burst, they release hundreds of growth factors and cytokines. That's this very complex system of traffic directors. So it's like the first responders that set up the barricades, stop the uh, emergency, get the traffic out of the way, but then um, uh, conduct a, a recovery of the site. So one of the things that they do in that effort to direct the cellular repair is they signal for stem cells. And stem cells can do anything. If we could only figure out all the buttons to push, stem cells could remake you at any age and could uh, heal any injury. We have that capacity when we are uh, very uh, primitive ontogenically, uh, that means developmentally. Um, in biology, they teach you the saying, ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. Ontogeny is the development of the embryo. Phylogeny is the classification of animals. We begin as very uh, primitive animals as eggs. We look like the various stages of evolutionary development as an embryo. The reason I'm bringing that up now is that primitive animals have much greater regenerative capacity. You can take um, a planarium worm, a very uh, uh, early evolutionary stage of development of life on Earth, and cut its head off, and it doesn't die. It will grow a new head. And then as you go up the evolutionary chain, you can cut off less and less until you get to a very complex organism like us that if you cut off your finger, it's not growing back, right? Mm -hmm. But that is relevant in that the reason that those primitive animals have that regenerative capacity is because of stem cells. And we still have those stem cells. They're turned off. They're restricted. They're directed in a very complex cascade, but the stem cells are still there. And if we can reverse some of that ontogenic development that brings us from the primitive to the very complex human being, once we can get inside how those things, those genes are being turned on and off, we will have control of that process and we will have complete regenerative capacity. We'll be able to regrow anything just like a salamander, you can cut off its hand and it grows back. Um, we still have that inside of us. We have it as a primitive embryo. And you can prove it. You can take um, a zygote at certain cells, like when it's up to um, several hundred cells, you can remove any part of it and it doesn't matter. Those cells will simply grow back and it'll still produce a normal human being. As it becomes more developed, you get more and more restricted on what you can remove without scarring, without damage. Um, but that means that it is inside of you still. It's there at birth, it's still there. It just turned off. So stem cells are a way of, in, in a very natural setting, using what your body has to regenerate and repair uh, damaged and aged tissues. And one of the most natural ways to use the amazing capacity of stem cells is to simply take platelet-rich plasma, allow the platelets to clot, where they release all of those um, cytokines and, and uh, uh, micro hormones that direct traffic there, and inject it. So now your body gets the, the, the signal that this is where stem cells need to go and they need to repair damaged tissue. So if we do that by injecting directly into the cavernosa of the penis, it stimulates regeneration. It's a youth enhancing, uh, reversing of aging and reversing of the negative consequences of aging like atherosclerosis and uh, weakening of tissue, the, um, um, the 
degradation of the length of the telomere is reversed with stem cells. Stem cells are stem cells because they lo have long telomeres, still have lots of cell divisions, can produce theoretically um, an infinite number of uh, cells because they produce the enzyme telomerase that each time they reproduce, they regrow the telomere, they don't run out. Um, so this is a very natural and very safe, very low uh, side effect uh, way of getting the stem cells attracted to that tissue so that they can rejuvenate uh, lost tissue. So we talked about these uh, cytokines. Here's how it's done. Uh, the, um, the growth factors are, are very soluble, mostly very small molecules, so they diffuse very easily. It turns out that when we use PRP for rejuvenation of an injured knee, for instance, we don't even have to be uh, very specific about where we inject it. The, the PRP will find the area that is damaged, direct stem cells there. The stem cells will start to figure out what kind of tissue they're in and decide whether they need to produce new bone, whether they need to produce cartilage, whether they need to produce collagen, new tendons, whatever is needed in that area, they will um, then differentiate into that tissue type and divide and repair. So I mentioned that because it really doesn't have to be very specific. The way we do it is we generally, we stretch the penis out so that we can see the veins and see the vasculature easy. And then we just inject fairly superficially. Um, one of the uh, common techniques is to inject one small injection on each side of the uh, penis in the cavernosa. Uh, and the results are pretty incredible. Regeneration and uh, rejuvenation. Uh, no real um, um, potential for side effects other than the local irritation from the injection site or if someone uses a bad technique. Uh, but other than that, because they're so natural, we use them for all kinds of tissue generation. This one has been around for a few years now, but we find that if we put it together with our total protocol, we're doing all of those other things, uh, the results are better than using it by itself, and the results are better than if we just use the other 13 steps by themselves. Uh, this is a, a photomicrograph of uh, some tagged uh, stem cells that were not injected into this area. Where that wound is, there, were, um, there was platelet-rich plasma injected, and then you see all the tagged stem cells came uh, directly to that site and differentiated to repair. So there's also the O-shot uh, for women, uh, although today we're focusing on men. Um, I want to um, now introduce you to our team here, Dr. Uh, Levitt and um, my practice manager, Austin, who I know many of you have met. Uh, Brandy is our uh, clinical manager, and we have a director of uh, clinical development and quality assurance, uh, Val, that I hope you guys get a chance to uh, uh, talk with. But she will be telling you about uh, some of these uh, shots. Uh, and, uh, and introducing a new program. Um, what I've decided to do relatively recently is to do our own clinical trial here where we look at direct stem cell injection into the penis. It's not very commonly done yet, although we're finding uh, a lot of studies. There are at least 200 studies uh, going on right now with uh, stem cell injections into various parts of the body. We've used them to um, uh, rehabilitate uh, hips and knees. Uh, they are the basis of um, a rejuvenation of the face that has become popular. We use them in a nebulizer that you inhale for people who have been uh, smokers, who have COPD, or when <coughs> people have emphysema. Um, we also can just uh, inject them into the blood where the, the stem cells then go to wherever they think they are needed. 
But we're very excited about using these together with PRP, and we've developed a new protocol where we will use the uh, PRP together with stem cells. Um, and Austin will tell you about some of the details of that. I thank you for attending, and uh, we look forward to seeing some of you uh, in the clinic. Thank you. Austin. Thank you so much, Dr. Sears. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about the different forms of, of treatment that we offer in the facility and the different types of protocols. And, and um, Dr. Levitt is here with me as well. She's uh, the clinic director here as well at the clinic. She's going to come with me and just answer any questions that you guys have. So today what we're really going to talk about is the different types of packages that we're offering for treatment here at the Sears Institute. Um, and those packages are, 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 are different. Some of them are larger and more incorporative and some of them are smaller. So of course we have the packages that just address some of the nutritional deficiencies and vitamin deficiencies which Dr. Sears has described. And then we also have other packages which address and include the PRP injections, the stem cell injections, and the different protocols. Today Today, Dr. Sears has actually authorized me to give away one free treatment for someone for this injection. So we are going to do that today before we leave, so don't leave without getting the chance to you know, potentially win that. Uh, we're also going to be giving away free books and all different kinds of things. Does anyone have any questions? I mean, of course, you get a free consultation with this appointment today, but and a lot of these questions I know are, are sensitive and, and better answered in the room, but does anybody have any questions that we can address as a team to help you? We could take a few, probably one or two. What about the FDA does not approve a lot of these, or it doesn't come under their control, is that correct? Well, as I, I think you're looking at two different things here. I mean, um, as far as supplementation, or are you speaking of the PRP and the stem cells? I'm um, speaking of supplementation, the, where you use a lot of these herbs which are, have, are not controlled by the FDA. You don't know whether the dosage and whether the purity of the item is correct. No, but that's where Dr. Sears comes into place because he understands the purity of each of his products and he specifically chooses products and he sources them so that we know that everything that you're receiving from us is of the highest quality and the correct dosing. Um, I'm uh, currently uh, going to an outfit in the Chicago area called Body Logic MD and mm -hmm. they're giving me uh, testosterone um, pellets. Mm -hmm. And after hearing what Dr. Sears has just said, I'm not so sure that's a smart approach. And that's one of the reasons why I traveled down here. Well, we're glad you're here. I mean, I don't think pellet therapy is necessarily a bad thing. The thing that we dislike about it is it's difficult to tweak the dosages. Once it's in there, it's in there, you know what I mean? And, it's, and, and hormones are a finicky thing. But, um, I, you know, I, there are a lot of different ways that we treat hormones, and Dr. Levitt can help you with that. Um, and, you know, I'm, you're a patient here. You've already had stem cells, so you can let everybody attest to the fact that they are wonderful, and we can try to help you in some other ways with that. Yeah, and more importantly, it's not so much, uh, there's many different delivery systems of testosterone. What's equally as important is to measure other elements like the estrogen and the DHT to make sure that your dosing is correct and that you're not having adverse well, side, I side effects. I here for uh, a testing, as you know, uh, right. months or so ago. Telomere testing. I got the report, report back and some things are really way off. Well, we'll look at that. We'll definitely look at that with you in an, in an individual console, okay? <laughs> Thank you for coming, Frederick. I know you came from a long way. Anybody else? What if you're on an anticoagulant? <coughs> Does that affect it? No, sir. You can be on an anticoagulant and still go through our treatments, okay? So here's what I'm going to do. So uh, for all event attendees, Dr. Sears has offered to extend a 25% discount on any protocols in which you guys wish to participate in today. So if anybody, the girls up front have three different protocols, you all can schedule a consultation, you all can get a discount on supplements, products, anything you would like to do. Um, and uh, Dr. Levitt will be out front taking questions. I'll be back here signing up appointments and we'll try to do our best to get you all accommodated. Please bear with us. I know there's a lot of us here. And um, I'll let you go ahead and go, and then I'll go ahead and give away the uh, the, the giveaways. Uh, thank you, Dr. Thank Levitt, you. very much for your questions.